prayer, pure in heart. Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for the time you are allowing us to come together tonight. Father, as we are gathered tonight and we study a portion of our word, we ask you to do with us that we may do so in spirit and in truth, rightly like dividing the word that you gave us, that we may understand it better, Father, to be better examples and better Christians for you. Father, we ask you to do for church throughout the world that, Father, that as we worship you, as you would have us to do, we ask you that we would do so in a loving manner, Father. Not because we fear you, Father, but because we love you. Father, we ask you to 
be of the sick that we mentioned tonight and many other ones that were not mentioned that we know you know about. We ask you to heal them, Father. Father, there are several in our congregation with, with broken bones and, and different ailments, health problems, Father. We especially ask you to do with them. Heal them, Father, if it be your almighty will. Father, again, we ask you to do with us during this class. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm going to try not to tear this thing up. This will be an NPPL tonight, a non powerful <coughs> lesson. That's for this man. Well, I'm glad you think so, brother. Kind of that podium, John. Good evening, brethren. It's good to be here tonight and good to see everybody. Mark asked me a week and a half or two ago if I would fill in for him tonight, so you can blame him. Last Wednesday night, we went over the information. We went over the information in a handout entitled, Are You in Christ? Uh, this handout, I believe, concisely shows us what the Bible says about being in Christ. Uh, including the blessings that are found only in Christ, including forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven, and so forth. And what the Bible also says must be done for us to get in Christ. I enjoyed that lesson. Um, basically, it tells us what we believe the Bible teaches about how to become a Christian, about what God asks of us, that a man or woman must hear the word of God, must believe that Jesus is God's son, must repent of our sins, confess Jesus as the Son of God, must be baptized for forgiveness of sins. At this point, we believe the Bible teaches that that baptized believer is a Christian and not before. After baptism, we believe the Bible teaches that a Christian must live a faithful life to God, keeping God's guidance from the Bible, and that Christian, if he does not, risk forfeiting his salvation. Revelations 2.10 tells us this is not on the handout. Be faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Some denominations teach the possibility of the apostasy of Christians, and some don't. There are differences in denominational teachings or doctrine on that point, or any denominational uh, doctrine. And having mentioned denominations, uh, let me just say that we in the Church of Christ do our dead level best not to be a denomination, uh, because we believe that the Bible teaches that division among those who would follow Jesus is wrong and that it specifically violates Jesus' teachings on unity and we'll look at some of those verses and other New Testament guidance in addition to what Jesus had to say. Some people may be surprised about that. I've got about a page of notes but I'm going to skip over them since this is secondary to our main lesson verses that talk about unity and save those for the end if we have time tonight. Um, I think it's a very import, important subject, but uh, having looked last week at what we believe the Bible teaches about becoming a Christian, we talked a little bit last Wednesday about the differences between our beliefs and those of some of our religious, God-fearing neighbors. Um, a lot of those folks believe the popular idea that the Bible requires uh, any man or woman just to believe in Jesus, uh, what we might refer to as a salvation by faith doctrine. Uh, then last Wednesday, a question was asked that in light of the many verses that we went over on our handout and some others that were mentioned, uh, in light of, of those uh, that seem to clearly teach that God asks something of us after we believe, uh, why do so many good people, so many people uh, believe in, that all one must do to become a Christian, to have your sins forgiven? is to believe in Jesus. There's got to be a good reason for that. The lesson tonight is to talk about what the Bible says about that. I'm not here to judge anyone. I'm here to show what I believe the Bible teaches, and we will look at what the Bible has to say about it. Uh, so if you are sitting here, or if it's someone listening online tonight, I hope you'll hear me out before you declare me a heretic. Totally by coincidence, as last night we're going through that lesson, we had just talked about that subject three days before in our class in the multipurpose room on Sunday morning about why so many people believe what we think the Bible clearly doesn't teach and don't believe what we think it clearly does teach. 
We have just started a study of the Gospel of John in that class, and we had gotten as far as chapter 1, verse 12, when that question came up about why do people believe this. Uh, so if you would, please turn in your Bibles, uh, since I don't have it on the screen for you to look at, to John chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 12. And so that you'll have the context for verse 12, uh, we'll go back to verse 1, where John begins his account of the life of Christ with these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. So John's just in the fourth verse of the first chapter, and he's already talking about things that are in Christ. Verse 4 starts out, In him, in Christ, was life. In him was life, and the light, life was the light of men, and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. To me, passages like this one need to be read slowly contemplatively uh, and allowed to percolate a little bit up here for me at least this is one of those passages that I believe can give us a much broader understanding of and a deeper appreciation for what Jesus Christ has done for each one of us when he created this world and then when he chose to leave heaven and come to this world not as its creator which he was but instead as one of the created ones as one of us. He gave up everything for us. He literally became one of us. And we need to give that a little thought on occasion and let it sink in. John 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, this is the verse that brought up the question, why do so many people believe that all one must do is believe in Jesus? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The two phrases, one at the beginning of this verse and the other at the end of the verse, uh, as many as received him and those who believe in his name refer to the same group of people, those who had accepted the claims of Jesus, that he was the Son of God, and believed the message that he came to deliver to mankind. Since the days of Martin Luther, I guess, many Bible-believing people have been taught and have come to believe that faith alone makes people children of God. But in this verse... It is clear that believers are not children merely because they're believers, children of God, but that believers have the right to become children of God. In Johnson's commentary, he explained it this way, it is not declared that they were made children by believing, but to the believer he gives the power to become a child. When one believes in Christ, his faith becomes the power to lead him to yield himself to God and to receive the word into his heart. He can then repent of sin, surrender to the will of the Father, and being baptized into Christ, he puts on Christ. He refers to Galatians 3 and verse 27 there. He becomes the Lord's brother or sister and a child of God by adoption. John 1 verse 12 contradicts the popular notion of salvation by faith only, and I hope to show some other verses in the New Testament that do as well. But that being said, it still begs the question, why then do people say that the Bible uh, allows, teaches a faith-only doctrine when we believe there's so much that disproves it? Why are so many people absolutely certain in their minds that this is what it takes to become a Christian, to have your sins forgiven, to get to heaven? I can't think of a more serious subject than this. And I'd like to spend our time tonight answering that question. One answer, perhaps the most prominent, this question was asked last week and, and this answer was given from the audience, is that they've heard that doctrine all their lives. Uh, from the pulpit, from Bible classes, lessons, uh, that idea has been taught to them on a frequent and recurring basis. Uh, so much so that with some, if you even suggest that it is not true, that it is not Bible-based, you'll be viewed as a ignorant individual or at maybe better than that, at least uninformed or misinformed individual. And by others, you will be viewed as a heretic, uh, uh, seeking to destroy their faith. That's not what I seek to do tonight. I seek to show us so that we will know what the Bible has to say about this subject. Another answer to that question is that there are actually quite a few verses in the New Testament that if not considered in their proper context, and some, if taken in context, 
say exactly that. The only requirement mentioned in those verses is belief or faith, uh, occasionally both. Uh, those words are used synonymously frequently in the New Testament. And we've all read those verses. We're going to go over a few of them in a second. Verses that these folks hang their hat on, that they base their salvation on. We know them, or certainly should, because they're in our Bibles. Before we look at this sampling of verses, I want to remind you of something that's intuitively, I know, but I've already alluded to it even. But in this part of the country, most of the people that we're going to have an opportunity to share the gospel with have attended some church part of their lives, and many, all of their lives. Many of them have read their Bibles on a regular basis. They are not unfamiliar with the Word of God. And over the course of their lives, they've heard hundreds, if not thousands, of sermons and Bible lessons on the Bible, on what it teaches. So then, why do they believe something so different from what we think the Bible plainly teaches? The following is just a sampling of verses that the folks in that faith-only group uh, believe, base their belief on. And when I say the faith-only group, I'm not speaking disparagingly. I've got friends and family that are in that group that I love dearly. Uh, these are some of their proof texts for faith-only salvation. They're not going to be new to you. The first one is John 3.16. I guess that's probably the first verse I ever memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if we're just looking at that one verse, what requirement is mentioned in this verse? This is where I ask for you to answer a question here. What uh, one requirement is given in that verse to have everlasting life. Believe. Believe in Jesus. And who was speaking when this was? It was Jesus Christ who said this. Okay. Uh, next verse, Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. We know this is part of the story of the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas had been imprisoned about midnight, singing, praying, earthquake, door of the jail, and the chains all open, fell off, and the jailer sprang in there, was about to take his life first, and Paul said, do thyself no harm, we're all here, and he asked Paul that question. Now, again, what single requirement did Paul and Silas give the jailer to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Two verses. Uh, another one. I've got about a half dozen here. Uh, Romans 3, 21 through 23, probably not as familiar to you. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Christ Jesus, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How do these verses tell us that right, the righteousness of God can be obtained? Through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. So this verse uses both faith and, and belief, one of the few that do. Romans 1.16, another very familiar verse to us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Power of salvation for everyone who does what? believes. You starting to see a pattern here, brethren? There are a lot of other verses that I could include, but even this very short list would be grossly incomplete if I did not include Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. What do we see in these verses? Saved by Grace through faith, right, uh, and definitely not by works. The definition of works could be discussed. I'm not going to do that tonight. There are a lot of other verses that we could include, but I believe this is a fair representation of what folks that, that I know and I've talked to uh, support, believe supports their faith-only salvation. So how can we possibly deny, I'm asking a question here, but please don't answer it, I've got to get through these points because I'm going to convince you you should believe in faith only if I don't get to the end of this lesson tonight. Uh, how do we possibly deny faith only salvation in the face of this imposing amount of evidence uh, that seems to support it? Have we been misled, mistaught, low these many years? Um, 
obviously a very convincing argument can be built on these verses alone uh, if that's all we look at. And as I've said, there are more. All right, first, to answer the question, why is it um, that, they, that this is not true, that that, that is a misconception at, at least? Uh, first, to say that our salvation is addressed solely by these few verses to the exclusion of other passages is at best not wise. Uh, some might say it's foolish. When Paul spoke to the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, we remember the verse 28 where he talked to the elders and said, take heed to yourselves and to the whole flock of God or to the flock of God over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The verse just prior to that, verse 27, he said, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. We certainly need to consider all that the Bible has to say, all that it teaches on any subject, and especially the subject of our salvation. So we're going to look at some other verses in conjunction with the ones that we've just looked at. We don't want to throw those verses out. We certainly believe every one of those. But we want to look at the whole counsel of God. Uh, all right, that was first. Second is to say that the verses that we've just looked at and others teach faith only. Uh, is to attribute a meaning to them that they simply do not contain. It may be, and it is true, that they contain only belief. They say only uh, faith. Uh, but those verses, uh, while they mention those two, nothing but those two, never say only faith saves you, only belief saves you. In fact, the one time the words faith and only are coupled in the New Testament is found in the book of James in chapter 2, verse 24, where we read, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You will not find faith only or belief only anywhere else in the Bible. There, it's clearly showing that faith only does not save one, does not justify one. In the context of this passage, it's clear James is not saying that we earn our salvation, uh, but is teaching that Christian faith leads one to participate in good works uh, and is evidence that one belongs to Christ. In James 2.14, a little bit before the verse we just read, I just read, James even asked the question, can faith save him? Referring to those who say they have faith but have no works. Um, then in verse 19, he adds, you believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So these verses certainly don't support a faith-only doctrine in the New Testament. Uh, it should also be noted that faith equals action. Faith uh, and belief uh, equal action in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11 is one Old Testament character after another, a lengthy list of them who by faith took action and accomplished great things for God. We're all familiar with that chapter, uh, referred to by some as faith's hall of fame, so I'm not going to take the time to go and look there. Certainly we must believe, we must have faith. In fact, Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, but without faith. It is impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But if we think that's all God requires of us, then we are willfully ignoring other verses. Faith is the beginning of our journey to salvation. It is absolutely a necessity, but it's not the end. In Romans 10, verse 17, we're told uh, how to acquire that faith that God requires of us that is necessary to please him. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we're not uh, spending time in God's word, familiar with God's word, um, then the faith that we have is not going to be as strong as it could be. I remember a teacher years ago telling the class that, that you may not believe this guy. We were all college age at that time, a long time ago. He said, but in five years, especially in 10 or 20, people that have been spending time in God's word every day or close to it, you're going to be able to tell a big difference in those people, in the way they conduct themselves, the way they live their lives. Faith is extremely important, and we gain it through reading God's Word. That's where it all starts. But faith or belief, again, isn't where it ends. There are other stipulations given in God's Word. As Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says, in speaking of Jesus, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation unto those who obey him. So what must we obey? Uh, just as Moses was told by God, 
Uh, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain, referring to the tabernacle and all the things pertaining to it. Uh, Moses was to stick to the pattern given him by God. Likewise, we're to stick to the pattern that Jesus in the New Testament gave to us. As Paul said in Romans 6 and verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that pattern of doctrine to which you were delivered. So to reiterate, the first two points that we began this discussion with is to say that our salvation, the salvation of our eternal soul, is addressed solely by a few verses or passages, uh, the ones that we just looked at earlier, to the exclusion of others is not wise. And to say that these verses or any others teach a faith-only salvation is to attribute a meaning to them that they simply don't, don't have, don't contain. While these verses obviously only speak of belief or faith, and some of both, none of them specifically say belief only, faith only, except James 2.24, which does not support a faith only uh, salvation. Now the third point is we could easily build a doctrine of salvation around any number of other selected verses if we just want to pull some out and ignore some others. Uh, and we're going to do that right here. Uh, if we don't, in other words, consider the whole counsel of God. If we don't look at everything the Bible has to say. For instance, we could say that confession, that Jesus is the Son of God, is all that is needed for salvation, since that's all Jesus mentioned in Matthew 10, verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Or Romans 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you'd like to construct an easy plan of salvation, there you go. Uh, and don't mind ignoring other verses in the Bible, the rest of the Bible. Then uh, you've got one right there. I remember hearing a story by... Eric Lyons, who has preached here on a number of occasions, said he asked a fellow once if he would mind having a Bible study with him. And the fellow looked at him and said, I know John 3.16, that's all the Bible I need. So I don't want a Bible study. And Eric said, there's not much you can do in the face of that kind of an attitude except pray for somebody. But 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 tells us not just John 3.16 is inspired by God. It tells us all Scripture is inspired by God. All right, we could, instead of confessing, say that repentance of sins is all that is needed to have salvation based on a number of verses, including Luke 13, 3, I tell you no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Acts 17, 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Second Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Acts 3 verse 19, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Luke 24 verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. A strong argument. A strong argument could be made from these verses and quite a few others that repentance only salvation is Bible based and is all you need. And of course, you saw this last one coming. I'm sure we could easily build a doctrine of salvation based on baptism only. First Peter 3.21, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. Colossians 2, verse 12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Mark 16, verse 16, who, who believes, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 2, 38, then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Galatians 3, 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Acts 22:16. I've got more on this one than any other one because it gets hammered the most. 
And why now are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The point is, brethren, that to look at any verse or group of verses to the exclusion of others is putting yourself on a very slippery slope. Whichever group of verses you choose, those about belief, those about confession, repentance, baptism, uh, we need to look at them all as Second Timothy 3.16, I mentioned earlier, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Peter warned us not to treat the scriptures in a careless or cavalier manner when he said in 2 Peter 3 and verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him, by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. We don't want to fall in that group, brethren. The word must be handled with care if we are to avoid the pitfall of failing to consider the whole counsel of God. That appears to be what happened when the faith only doctrine of salvation was constructed. To me, I tell you what, I'm gonna save this last part for the invitation. I'm just about to the end of my notes, so let me go back to that part I skipped over earlier. And we'll wrap up that lesson when I extend the invitation. I was talking about denominationalism and how denominationalism um, we believe to be wrong in that it violates Jesus' teachings and other teachings contained in the New Testament. Some people may be surprised at that. How could denominations be wrong? That's where everybody goes to church, isn't it? So where in the world do we get that idea? The answer, of course, is from the Bible, where we should get uh, everything that has anything to do with our Christianity. Before we get uh, too deep into this, I'm checking how much time do we have in here, brother? I got a little bit more time. Good. This will take about five minutes. I just want to make sure we weren't going to run out. First, Jesus prayed for unity in a prayer to God shortly before his crucifixion. In John 17, verses 20 through 23, which is near the end of a lengthy prayer by Jesus, we read this. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and as I am in you, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you loved me. In these four verses, Jesus uses the word one five times. He uses it to describe the relationship he wants uh, that he has between himself and his father. Uh, he uses it to describe the relationship that he wants between uh, uh, those who believe in him and his father. Uh, I'm a little bit off on my notes here. The relationship he has with his father is one. The relationship that his father and he have with those who believe in him as is as one. And finally, he uses it twice to describe the relationship that he wants to exist among the followers, among ourselves, not between us and God or us and Christ. Now, I could be mistaken, but that just sounds like it's awfully important to him. He has used that word many times and I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Jesus clearly says twice in these four verses that unity among his followers, meaning those who believe in him and who seek to follow him and are obedient to him, is at least one way the world will believe that Jesus was sent by God. That's in verse 21. Then later in verse 23, he says the same thing, that the world may know that you have sent me. First, that the world may believe that you sent me. Second, that the world may know. I think that's incredibly important. Unity among the believers, among us here at Liberty, is incredibly important, and certainly among uh, God's people everywhere. 
Second, in Paul's first letter, second passage that I think talks again about unity and its importance, in Paul's first letter to the brethren at Corinth, he pleads with them in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, and he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He goes on to hammer that point home, but I think you get his drift from verse 10. So let me repeat, Paul said that you all speak the same thing and that, you be, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Is there anyone that sees that kind of unity when looking at the denominational world? I don't. Third, Jesus himself said in Mark 3, verses 24 and 25, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. You know, brethren, we all studied fractions in grade school. One-fourth is a fraction. The top number is the numerator, and the bottom number is the what? The denominator. Even the name denomination is self-condemning. Listen, I have a cousin who is a Baptist, he tells me that he teaches his Sunday school class that denominationalism is sin. I said, preach on, brother. I asked him what he meant by that, and he said, the, the evidence from the Bible is too overwhelming to deny it. And I realize that some will cavalierly say, I've been told this, we are united. We're all united in Christ. At the risk of being redundant, I'd say that that's not the kind of unity Jesus spoke of in his prayer in John chapter 17, nor is it anywhere close to the unity Paul pleaded for in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And that logic flies in the face of Jesus' plain statements in Mark 3 about divided kingdoms, divided houses. And I remind those of you here in this auditorium and those watching online that Jesus said unity is one way at least that the world will know that he was sent from above. In other words, disunity will adversely affect our ability to take the gospel to the world, to carry it throughout the world. And Satan loves it. That's all I've got to talk about. Do you have any comments before the bell gets around to ringing sometime soon? I say that He believed in Jesus. He did believe, but he wasn't saved. He was told to go and you'll be told what you must do. Yes, and he did. And what did Ananias do? I'm sorry, go ahead. What Paul did after he obeyed the gospel, mm -hmm. he wrote all these other epistles. Is he going to contradict Jesus Christ by telling them something other than what Jesus Christ said? Therefore, I say chronologically and logically, it is not sound to say, say by faith only. Very good point. A sound argument, I'd say. You know, one thing that's important to realize is that when Paul went to see, uh, went to, was taken by the hand and led into Damascus after being struck blind on the road there by Jesus, and Jesus spoke. He stayed in a place, Ananias came to him. At this point, Paul had been without food and water for three days. Ananias comes to him and speaks to him and tells him, Acts 22 and 16, 
Paul is recounting what happened in, back in Acts chapter 9 to a group of Jews in Jerusalem, and he tells them, Ananias told him, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. When Paul, who had been without food and water for three days, got his eyesight removed, Ananias, as, as, as it were, scales fell from his eyes and he could see again, what's the first thing you would have done? You know, if you knew Jesus Christ, you're going to go get baptized. Most people would say, why didn't he get something to eat, something to drink? Three days without it? Get something to eat and drink, then go get baptized. No, it's too important. If you look at examples of baptism in the book of Acts, uh, specifically the Philippian jailer who was told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he was in Philippi for heaven's sake. How far is that from Jerusalem, Judea? How much did he know about Jesus Christ? Probably nothing. A Gentile, he was told the first thing to do. That is not all that Paul told him because this was after midnight. He took him, washed his stripes, and he and his household were baptized after midnight. That verse says he rejoiced after baptism and not before it. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is another one who uh, came to know of Jesus through Philip's preaching on, on the road as he was traveling through Gaza. And uh, when uh, Philip took the scroll that he was reading from the prophet Isaiah, the text says that he preached unto him Jesus. And so as they're going along, the eunuch looks down and says, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Obviously, when Philip preached unto him Jesus, he preached to him the plan of salvation, which included baptism. And Philip said, if you believest, then you mayest, the old King James says. And so the eunuch said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he stopped the chariot, he went down in the water, and he baptized him. The Spirit took Philip away. The eunuch went on his way rejoicing. You don't read of anybody rejoicing once they believe, once they repent, once they confess. It's only after they've been baptized. It's not mentioned in every instance, but in those two it is at least. Thank you for those comments, Billy. Anyone else have anything? You know, brethren, there are a few of us in here that didn't grow up in the Church of Christ. There's a few of us that grew up other places, and so we saw. I can't tell you how many times I remember walking in newness of life, which is a part of Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, how many times that was mentioned, but I was never taught that that had anything to do with baptism. But it has everything to do with baptism. Matter of fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, I now declare unto you the gospel, <coughs> best I can recollect, which you received, wherein you stand, whereby you are saved, how Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures, was buried, and raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. So Paul declares to us there, tells us what the gospel is. There's numerous verses that say Jesus is going to return uh, second. Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 7. To those that, of you that are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus will return with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel. Peter said, if, if uh, judgment begins with us, what will happen to those? What will become of those who obey not the gospel? So how do you obey the gospel if the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I wish I had a chalkboard. This is so simple. I don't have anything I can write on. If I wrote on that, I'd get shot by the preacher. The gospel is Jesus comes down, dies on the cross. He is buried in that tomb. He is raised from the dead by God. And then about 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. How do you obey that? Well, if you can picture that, He's coming down from heaven on this end. He's going back to heaven on that end. And between it, you've got the cross, the tomb, and he's being raised from the dead, just an arrow pointing up. That is exactly what Paul says Romans 6 and verse 4 is. It is, you take, draw a box around that and put water across the top of it. When we go down into the waters of baptism, oh 
man, I, I can't quote Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. But uh, let me, it's just important enough. Let me, y'all give me a second here. That was the second bell, wasn't it? I don't tend to hear bells. I kind of ignore them. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 tells us, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him. That's the death and the burial. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's the raised him from the dead. That is, we don't become Christians by being baptized. We become Christians by doing everything God required of us. The culminating event is baptism, and that's why I think there's so much said about it, and it makes it hard to, to understand why it's not understood better, but that is how we become Christians. Then, of course, we don't have our ticket punched. We still have to live faithfully, and there are a number of verses that say that. We'll have to have another lesson on uh, the impossibility of apostasy and the falsehood that that is as well. That's also an interesting one, um, dating back to about 300 A.D. when Augustine taught that, and then John Calvin, the French theologian, picked up everything Augustine believed, and he espoused it a thousand years later and made it very popular. Uh, another lesson for another day. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate you not going to sleep on me. I completely forgot I was going to offer the invitation. I'm sorry, Perry. We spent some time in here tonight talking about a few different things. Um, let me find my spot in my notes here. They are way out of order. Probably the sheet I need right there. We were talking in here primarily about what it takes to become a Christian, what a lot of the religious world believes, and what we believe the Bible plainly teaches. Um, there are many. Uh, I've got family and friends, I was saying, that fall in this group that believe all you must do is believe in Jesus, have faith in Jesus, and you become a Christian. You can't hardly turn on the TV these days without seeing Franklin Graham uh, preaching that and asking folks to pray the, the sinner's prayer, which you will not find in the Bible. The closest you're going to come is Simon the sorcerer, who had become a Christian and fell away and was told to pray that God would forgive him, but not for an alien sinner. We talked about how hearing the word of God and believing is, is not an issue uh, for folks that believe in, in faith-only salvation, but the rest of it is. And to me, it's kind of like using a cake recipe, and I don't mean to oversimplify or, or make this into a joke. It's not, but if you had a cake recipe that began at the bottom page on your cookbook, so you started reading, and it tells you, using a large mixing bowl, add four cups of flour, two cups of milk, and then you're at the end of the page. And so that's all you put in the bowl. That's all you put in the oven. I can guarantee you, you're going to be disappointed in the cake that comes out of the oven. You need to turn the page and keep reading to see what the remaining ingredients are, what else is required. So it is with God's Word and our salvation. It's true that we must hear the Word of God that we must believe that Jesus is his son, but that's not the end of the recipe. The Bible also tells us to repent of our sins. It tells us that we have to confess that we believe he is the son of God and do it publicly and be baptized, as Paul was told, to wash your sins away. If we are dedicated to obeying to Christ, to sticking to that form of doctrine that we talked about in class, that pattern that Jesus gave us, then we will search the scriptures for the whole counsel of God 
and we will cling to it. Um, and regarding what God's Word says about becoming a Christian, the whole counsel of God includes hearing the Word of God, believing in Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing your belief that He is the Son of God, and then being baptized and following baptism, living a life faithfully. If you have a need to do that, then please come forward as we stand and serve. Oh, at the door. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time thanking you for blessing us with yet another opportunity to worship you in this midweek Bible study. Lord, I pray that you uh, be with us as we depart now. May we take the things that we've studied and discussed tonight to heart, use them to grow closer to you. And if any heart here has been pricked to turn their lives over to you, Lord, I pray that you push them in the right direction. To, uh, to be baptized and to um, turn, their, turn their lives and their spiritual, uh, their spiritual eternity over to you. Lord, I pray that you be with us now as we depart and we get to our destination safely and the next point in time with, that, we, that we all meet here again safely. Lord, I pray uh, this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.